everybody, if everybody can open up their uh, computers, we're gonna do it live with y'all here, with y'all on, on your computer, so that we can understand the beginning to the end of the whole process. So the first one is opening it up to your command, if everybody can get to their command site. We're gonna start off with creating a contact. And we're gonna keep everybody the same person today. So we're all gonna be Mickey Mouse. But well, if you wanna be many, not Mickey, it could be many. <laughs> so let's create a contact. Everybody know how to add that? If not, follow me. We're gonna hit add contact. And we're gonna put the name in, full name. I'm gonna be many. We're gonna put an email address. We're gonna put a phone number. And Marty Brosky just walked in the house. So when we get to the contract part, Marty is gonna go over the full contract with us. And he's going to explain some highest and best and the best way of winning some of these um, bids out here that we've been going through. Once we create the content, you can tag it. And today we're doing buyers, so you want to put it as a buyer lead. And we're going to hit create. Now we just created and contact. Okay. So I think I have the same email in for many already. So let me switch that out. Yes. Let me know when everybody has gotten that on a computer. All right. Everybody got a contact created? Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse. Do anybody need help? Did you want to try and see if you can? I'm not on. Yeah. You're not on. Okay. No problem. No problem. You good, Tracy? Do you need me to look for your computer and see if you're good? Um, I just Okay. It's for me. All right, so the next one we're going to go to is opportunity, which is the handshake. We're going to create an opportunity. Now you'll see on your, on your desk, I gave you three different pages. One is going to be the tax record, one is going to be the agent information, and one is the MLS property sheet so that we don't have to toggle back and forth. I'll show you where to get it so you know where to get it, but you have the information in front of you for easy access. So when we create the opportunity, we're gonna hit create opportunity in the right-hand corner. We're working with the buyer today. So on the opportunity type, it's gonna be buyer. If you're working with the listing, it would be the listing. If you're working with the landlord, it'd be the landlord, a tenant to tenant. In this case, today is buyer, all about the buyer. We're gonna find our client, which was Minnie Mouse or Mickey Mouse. Estimated closing date. Generally a closing date when you're working with the buyer is anywhere from 45 days to 60. Um, the computer is only gonna allow you, uh, well, you can estimate 90 days because by the time you find the property, get it under contract, get it through attorney, redo everything, get to the closing is about 60, 90 days together. So today is July, we're looking to close more than likely June, July, August, until October. October 31st would be a good estimate. Let me know if I'm going too fast or if you can't see where I'm at. The handshakes on the left hand side. Time frame, we're going to put three months. Budget, this property is 375. Assuming that we are still in the market that we are now, it's going to be a bit more zone or for less than the asking price, more than likely. So we're gonna just work with the listing price right now. Commission, your commission is gonna be on the bottom of your MLS page, which is 2.5 minus 300. You're only gonna be able to put 2.5 in the percentage. The phase, you in the appointment phase. 
So you're in the process of scheduling appointments for your buyer. And then you're gonna hit create. That's the general information. If you need to change and edit the information, you're gonna use the little pencil. The pencil will allow you to add and change and edit any, any information that you need to edit. You just scroll down, make any changes you need. Um, say the financing type. We're going to work with um, Marty. You want to work with conventional or FHA today? Sorry, that? FHA or conventional when we do the contract. Day one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. Let's go with conventional today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we say that. Now on the right hand side, you have the property, the actual property. So when you click on that pencil. You can add the property address you're working with. In this case, you look on the uh, sheet, it's 102, one half west. And you see as I'm typing, it's coming up, which make it easy. You select the one you want. If there's a um, apartment, because we deal with condos a lot, address number two, make sure you put the apartment number in there. And then we hit save. Now this is this detail for this part of command. Next, we're gonna to go to our document. Let me know if everybody's um, with me. Everybody with me? Our documents, how do we get our documents to come in? Well, we're gonna start a transaction. When we click start a transaction, we're gonna hit DocuSign. Some people are still working with Loop, so if that's the case, that's what you do. But if you're new, you're working with DocuSign. Let's connect. And you're going to see a room. So DocuSign has room. This is a blank room. In this room, we're going to add our documents and we're going to add our details. On the left hand side, you see there where it says details. You want to click on details and you want to add everything about the buyer, everything about the seller, the listing agent, the buyer agent, um, the property address that you can. So let's take a few minutes and do that. Where do I get the information for the selling? Uh, who's the seller? You have to go on the tax records. So when you go to Paragon, now I gotta log in. I'll do it from my computer. So y'all have the sheet. I just wanna be able to show you where you get that actual information from. How to access the tax record. This way. Paragon is the access to the information. Yeah, you can access from, from Paragon in your MLS. Is that the office that you use Paragon for? Yeah, um, no, Paragon is your MLS. Okay. It's your whole database for the whole system of listings wherever for Hudson County. I have one Okay. So when we get to Paragon, this is the home page. You want to go to your tax record. Hudson County, New Jersey tax records. We wanna to go to the property. Um, we do know the property street. Um, we know it's Hudson County, we know it's Bayonne and it's West 22nd. So you would just look for um, West 22nd, I mean West 52nd, 102. When you click on West 52nd, it's two of them. So we want the one that says one half. And then the tax record will come up and there you will have, there's two owners on here. Uh, so you wanna use both owners names. Now, since this is my listing, I know Anthony name is missing, um, her husband name. So it'll be Anthony with his last name and Raquel Marty. Um, you're gonna need to block the lot, the land description. You wanna verify on the property description, whether it's a one unit, a two unit, three unit, this is your building description. So it's a two-story brick, um, I'm not sure what the D is because you see that C-chat, one unit and this is attached with P. Uh, 2020 is the estimated taxes, you're gonna need the taxes. The square footage, New Jersey tax record has started putting square footage in for the house. Just be careful because it can be off. So this is always gonna be approximated. The year was built 1950 and the owner's address. Yes, absolutely. 
Can you speak in the mic? You want to come up here with me? Why people online? People online that can't hear you. Uh, I'm loud enough to hear you. Uh, well, the camera is back behind you, so you have to come behind me. Uh, All right, so real quick, an issue that we're going to run into a lot. There you go. The tax records. It has to deal uh, with square footage, excuse me. It has to deal with condominiums. Um, we're going to find a lot of times where the listing um, you know, references the square footage. Like, for example, I think most of us would look at a condo unit that's 20 feet wide by 40 feet deep, and we would call that 800 square feet, right? Kind of makes sense. Except that what happens is when we get like the appraisal report back or something, all of a sudden it says 640 square feet. And now your buyers are screaming and yelling. What are you talking about? It says 800 and it's 640, blah, 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 right? So here's what happens that people don't realize, which is that on the condominium, you do not own the walls. The association owns the walls. All the partitions between your kitchen and your bathroom and your bedrooms, you don't own it. There's structural supports for the unit above you, right? There's plumbing, there's electric all this stuff that makes it the association's actual property. If you wanna move it or open it up, you need permission from the association. So each wall, if you actually measure from face of the sheetrock to the other side face of the sheetrock is approximately six inches thick, right? Half a foot. So now if you figure out that we take all of our walls inside the apartment and it's like 160 square linear feet, right? Around every closet, bathroom, you name it. Well, guess what? 160 linear feet of wall times half a foot thick is 80 square feet, right? So now where we would have advertised a property at 800 square feet, right? The master deed or the tax records might show it in that example, is 720 square feet, all right? For our client's purposes, obviously the unit is the right size that they saw, right? It's just that everything is calculated on a net square footage. So just be prepared to explain that to your buyers and also to be more careful about what you post about square footage on your listings, right? It might make sense on that listing to try to get a copy of the master deed and all of our clients who say they don't have it, trust me, they have it, or they can get an email from their management company as a PDF. And then you will see the actual square footage in there. So we don't get blamed for saying it's 800 square feet when it's only 720. All right, thank you. Thank you. See, you learn it every day, 20 years in the business and I'm just learning that, really? <laughs> I wanted to ask a question. Um, you said that you know these uh, the owners. So do we have to do these tax records? Or do you add in the name like you said? So you add in the name. So sometimes the tax records is like that. It's always good to call and talk with the listing agent. Should I use the name that is on the tax record as it is? And then that listing agent will be able to correct you if there is an incorrection on there. Now, sometimes, say, the husband is deceased. You looking at the tax record, you're preparing your paperwork based on the tax record when you're doing a listing, and it, he doesn't exist anymore. So you always want to verify with the owner at that point, okay, are the decision makers present, which would be Anthony and Raquel. Okay, no problem. So that's where you're going to get your tax records to fill in the details for the right hand side, which is seller one, and then you have seller two. And then your listing agent, where do I get those details from? I'm gonna go back to that same MLS. I'm gonna look up the, the property. And when you look up the property, you receive the listing agent information. Oh, my mouth going to act up. Okay. All right. 
So there we have it. That's the listing. You scroll down, you see my name, you click on it, and you see all my details as far as my company, my address, my phone number. When you're doing a contract, you want to make sure it's complete as possible because if you're going in a bidding war and you have a contract that's half and not filled in completely, trust and believe the listing agent is going to look at you like a lazy agent because you did not fill in everything. So that will be the second piece of paper that you see on there. So when we go to there, you can fill it in. And then how do I get the license number for that agent? It's right there on the MLS. You see Keller Williams, 1650524, and you see Carrington, 0230714. You're going to need the license number when you get to the contract so that we're making sure we fill in all the details that we need possible. Now, I printed out everything so that you have the MLS sheet, which is going to have the commission on there and everything that you need um, so that we don't have to toggle back and forth. But I wanted to show you where you would get that information so that when you're on your own, you know where to go. This is being recorded, so you can always refer back. All right, let's go and we complete our details. Very vital fill in a details. If you have any uh, questions, let me know. I'll give you uh, 10 minutes to get all those details in from the documents I gave you. You're still in command. You at the opportunity and you created the opportunity. Uh, let me bring up the actual one as complete so that. Um, they can follow through and then I'll come to you directly. Everybody online, I hope you are taking notes or have your computers open so that you too can follow through. If you have any questions, uh, put it in a text and I will try to follow through uh, to help you out. When you finish, yours should look like this on a computer in front of you. I'll give y'all five minutes. I'll give y'all online five minutes. I'm going to help the agent out now. I'm going to 
Hopefully everybody up there is good. You're welcome. All right, so once we get this all completed, it should look like seller one, then we got seller two, all the information in. We got listing agent one. Now you're gonna fill in the buyer agent. So you want to um, the buyer information and you're going to your information should automatically come up because you are the buyer. So I'm going to go back to my sample with Minnie Mouse. Make sure I'm in my practice one, not my real one. <laughs> What's the matter, Yolanda? <laughs> I'm laughing at you and your mini and your Mickey and your mic. Is that your mic? Your hand sanitizer? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, there's, there's my mini. So you want to make sure you put the buyer in. We can create a buyer today. Um, Donald Duck. Buyer number one, Donald Duck. Well, we already said mini or Mickey, so we don't have to do that. Um, buyer agent. Should be all your information should come up. You see how everything for Karen came up, everything for Keller Williams came up. That should be you as the buyer agent. On the left hand side now, we want to make sure that we put in uh, the address, and I'm gonna hit my edit so I can make any changes. Uh, we have the MLS ID, so you can take that off of the paper. Add the MLS ID, which is two one zero zero sixteen four sixty four. We're going to add an offer details, offer date, which was we're working in today's date. We're not going to fill in everything because we're going to fill that in on a contract. So sometimes these boxes go where you don't want it to go. Um, closing details. We don't have to worry about that. We can put that on the actual contract, additional information. Buy side commission, you are the buyer. Don't worry about what the seller is getting, the listing agent is getting. You just want to make sure yours is 2.5 minus 300. And again, that's going to be on the MLS paper. If you follow back, it'll be on the MLS. Um, you're giving out a referral, make sure you put that in there. Tax amount, we're going to get the tax amount from the tax record that we printed out. So the tax amount is Everybody see the tax amount? 8460. Did everybody see that? Um, that's here. Where to get that from? Remember, I said you're going to need the lot size. The lot size is 19.32 by 100. Everybody follow online? That's online. Again, I'll stay away from the square footage. It's a two bedroom, two bathroom. This room, this um, unit actually has two living rooms, a dining room, kitchen. Um, so we have two bedrooms, two, two, three, four, four room total. Garage, it has one garage. Once you finish all that, you can actually hit save. And we can move to our next step. The purpose we take our time in making sure that we have all the document, all the details filled in ahead of time is so that everything will transport automatically syndicate to our document when we get ready to go to pull in our documents. You're not writing the seller's name over and over. You're not writing your name over and over. You're not writing color rooms over and over. You do it once, it's time consuming, but once you do it, it's there and 
Unless you made a mistake, you don't have to worry about going back. So our documents, how do we add our documents in? You switch from details to documents and you hit the add button. Now we was pulling something off the computer, say we wanted to download the tax records, we wanted to download anything else, we'll download it onto our state, uh, on hard drive and then we can add anything from the computer. We wanted to add the tax record, the MLS sheet, um, the agent sheet, and that's how we would add it. Then we would hit add DocuSign to bring in our forms, our actual forms. We have groups and we have the library. If you can't find anything in a group, you're gonna to go to the library. In this instance, we're working with the buyer, so you're gonna use the buyer, buyer transaction packet. It's the same packet if you're working in Essex County, Hudson County, Burden County, whatever county, the contract does not change. So it's only gonna be one buyer transaction packet wherever you work working at. If you're doing a listing, that's when you would use CJ Garden State, New Jersey, Hudson, depending on what uh, county you're working in. Now you see it's all in red. The ones that are in red are the ones that we're gonna use, which is the attorney general memorandum, consumer information statement, home warranty. You don't need your commission bill yet. Um, you could put it in your room, you just don't need it. If you're doing a CMA for that buyer, you don't need the letterhead yet. But if you're doing a um, CMA, you wanna put the disclosure in there, I told you how to put in. Offer the purchase, we do not do offer the purchases. We wanna do a full contract. Um, you're only going to do an offer to purchase if it's what, um, six units, Marty, um, six parcels, uh, anything over four units, we're going to do an offer to purchase for, right? Commercial, commercial for an offer to purchase. The only time you want to use an offer to purchase versus a standard contract. Don't know about our purchase um, well, you write up a contract for commercial. But we're just talking about a contract versus an offer per purchase. Okay. Like an offer of purchase is just one letter of intent. Oh, okay. So when can you write it up versus doing your offer? Correct. We okay. don't do contracts because that's lazy. Wait, I mean, an offer right. purchase for a contract. That's lazy. You want to do it for a contract. But for one page offer the letter, offer it to purchase. Right. So then you're using that form and then the lawyers will write it. So that's more so like a mixed use property or. Is anything where you're, you know, it can be a mixed use, but it can be your standard form too. It's like two, three units upstairs and one store one downstairs. Okay. Right? You can always call it, here's the reality. If it's the wrong contract, we just replace it. In oh, okay. Brain. So that's good. <laughs> so there's so many contracts, I get the standard contract from co op. Yeah, co op is like different. Have, you know, mm -hmm. And then we pick it. So better to get it in the door than to wait an extra day or two while you figure it out and miss the opportunity. Okay, so offer the purchase if we're going to do it. Um, that would be pre pretty much commercial, not a residential offer, um, unless the listing agent specified they only want the one page offer. New Jersey affiliated service agreement, informed consent to do an agency. Um, PA in New Jersey affiliated service disclosure, consumer information, um, lead, any house built before 1978, we have to use it. Now you don't want your client to sign a blank lead. Again, you want to go to the MLS, you want to look at the documents that's on the MLS, and you want to pull the lead statement from the MLS and put that into your room. So you're going to download that, and we'll put 102 and a half. Lead. And that's the one that you want to bring into your room as well. You want to bring the, the booklet. They need the booklet, but the actual lead document, you want to bring that in from the MLS. 
If it's not on the MLS, call the listing agent, ask them for it. Um, the whole harmless, remember, we're using a new whole harmless so that it only has to be signed by your buyer, not the seller. Your contract, of course, informed consent to do an agency. We're going to bring our lead in from the other one, the wire. And let's see if there's anything else on here. We're not doing F FHA. If you're doing any addendum, you have to bring those in. If you're working with a condo or a homeowners association, you have to bring that addendum in. If you work with uh, FHA, then you'll bring those in. If there's a pool, if your client need a seller concession in this market, it's not going to apply. Um, the addendum regarding coronavirus, you still can use the addendum that gives your client 30 days if something should happen. Um, let's see. Exclusive by agency agreement. So those are all your documents that you're going to need to transport and add into your room. Uh, really. Same thing, Kevin. John Carlos, you online? Can you see if something's going on with DocuSign for us? Oh. Come on now, DocuSign. All right, so what we will do is go to a document that I already have completed. Okay, it's back working now, it's back working. Let me just get everything that we had back in the room. Don't call us, sorry, don't need you now. <laughs> Hopefully everybody online is also following along. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna go through each and every document. So we don't hold Mr. Broski up too long because he's a busy attorney. We're gonna start off today with the actual contract. Find the contract in JAR 118, contract for sale. Okay, let's rock and roll. I'm going to jump over this. Well, you, you, you want to control the computer or you want me to type in the store? Oh, you're going to type in stuff. Yeah. Okay, so stay right where you are. How many people are online? I need to know how many people I'm talking to. <laughs> the Yolanda, because she's just always. <laughs> All right, so um, first, is there a chat window or something in here? Uh, yeah, there should be a chat window. That was my cell phone number. Listen, for everybody who hasn't worked with me, you know, you're all brand new agents or some of them have been doing Some new, some have been doing it for a little bit. Okay. All right, those who have been doing this for a while, Still listen to me. You're gonna actually learn some stuff, right? Oh, you talking uh, to me? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But the other thing I want you to know is to try to get into your heads that I know that most agents think of a lawyer as I already have a signed contract. Who can I send it to who's not gonna screw it up? Right. And maybe they see me on all the emails and that'll be great. That's a good lawyer. Really, I'm very different from most in that I'm really part of the sales team, right? If you're in a listing and you got a question or a problem, they want to listen to you, or they try to say, I'm not going to sign until I get some questions answered, you can call me, text me, day, nights, weekends. I will get on the phone with you and your client, and I'll talk them off the cliff. 
whether it's the sales side, the buy side, an inspection, panic attack, you name it. So Karen's gonna try to type in my cell phone number. I'll just give it to you right now. But it's 732-616-0527. So if we haven't worked together before, if we haven't, you're just not sure I got it. Shoot me a text message that just has even your first name, right? And I'll just say you on my phone. What? My name is Marty, Martin Brodsky, <laughs> okay? Where's the, my introduction slide? I should have like a multimedia. <laughs> Nothing, huh? Yeah, um, yeah, a little introduction, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why you get most of your commission goes to you. You know, keep it up to take in my intro. <laughs> All right, but I'll save you on my phone. Um, and really, that way, if you call me or text me, I'll pick up for you because I know who you are and I know it's important, right? If you're not in my phone, it's a risk I won't pick up because I might be busy. All right, so um, just try to think of me really as part of the team, as a resource, just like you might call Karen and say, hey, I need your help on something. You can call me on the same thing. All right, so what I'm going to do is go through the contract with you from an attorney perspective, right? Because I know that once you get a fully signed contract, you send it to the lawyer. And then you're like, get me out of review, get me out of review, why aren't we? <laughs> right? So, but I don't think anyone really knows what attorney review is, like what we're doing and what we're changing, what we're fixing, what we're correcting. And, and everything that we've got to change delays how quickly we can get out of attorney review. And some changes we make blow the deal up, right? And there are things that, maybe if we handled properly up front, wouldn't have caused an emotional reaction that set or killed it on us. So I'm going through the contract, not from the perspective of your you know, real estate commission regulations, but from what, on a practical level, we're actually doing and changing. So um, I assume this is a live screen for everybody. Yeah. All right, so the first thing we've got here is the buyer. And that's the first place that there is errors, right? So the first thing that I'm gonna ask Minnie in this example is, are you single or are you married? And of course, Minnie happens to be married to Mickey, but you didn't put Mickey on the contract because Mickey isn't on your pre-approval letter from your lender. So you think, oh no, he doesn't go on the contract. That's wrong because real quick, under New Jersey matrimonial law, when a home is a principal marital residence of a couple, your spouse owns part of this house, whether they're on the deed or not, right? So as a result, they're gonna need to sign certain documents at the close. The document that you call the mortgage, a couple of affidavits, Right, and always when I ask Minnie, hey, did we leave Mickey off the contract on purpose? Does he not want to own any part of this house? The answer is no, no, he wants to own it. He's just not on the loan, right? So now we're going to add Mickey to it. But how do you deal with the fact that Mickey is not on the pre-approval letter? One, most people don't care, but if you really did care, just shoot down to paragraph 43. Where is it? Let's in there. Uh, almost there. There we go. Right? So you got this big giant blank that you can type anything you want in. And you would just type in there, put the number one or A, whatever. Right? And just say, you know, Mickey Mouse is not part of the mortgage application but is in title only, right? So he owns it, but he's not on the application. Now, every now and then, Minnie tells me, no, we don't want Mickey owning any part of the house. He's got other debts or issues on him that would screw up his deal. Or we've agreed he has another house in my, his name, I have this one in my name. We can do that, but that's actually something 
that I have to write up between the two parties where Mickey would have to sign what's called a quick claim deed, waiving his marital interest in the property. And that gets done before closing. Now, all of this you're not expected to know. The point of this is to tell you that whenever you've got some sort of complicated question, just call me, right? This is really legal advice and you should not be giving matrimonial legal property settlement advice. Get your lawyer on the phone, right? But we can go back to the beginning. So buyer's name, right? Should include both people if they are married, even if only one is on the application. Any questions on that? Up there? Um, that's that's um, a good takeaway because I do have a couple and I've been with them for six months and we put in many, many contracts and only the husband name was on there because he was the only one that was pre-approved. But um, let's say you're selling a home. Huh? Right? Let's say you're selling a home now, right? You're taking a listing and the tax records show Minnie Mouse. But you know Minnie Mouse is married to Mickey Mouse and Mickey Mouse lives in the home. Do we need Mickey Mouse to help us sell this property? His name is not the deed. Yes, you do. Because as soon as they live in that house after they're married, it doesn't matter what they did beforehand. Right? Once they're married, he owns part of that house. At a minimum, he owns the right to live there for free. Right, so just imagine, they get married, they move in, they have a fight because Mickey comes home and finds Minnie in bed with Goofy, right? <laughs> Man. <laughs> and now, of course, Minnie goes, get the hell out of my house. You don't own it. Can she kick him out? Nope. Nope, she can't because he has the legal right to be there. She's got to go through the court system, restraining orders, whatever it might be. So if you can't kick Mickey out, you also can't sell the house out from under Mickey. So we better find out when we're doing a listing, is Mickey gonna cooperate in the sale? Because if he's not, someone's gonna have to go to court before you waste your time listing this property. A lot of times we'll have something where Mickey and Minnie are on the deed, but when you go for the listing, Minnie tells you, Oh, we got divorced and he agreed I got the house. But, but the deed hasn't been changed. Oh, well, he was supposed to sign it at the divorce. Well, he didn't. And guess what? We can't sell this house. So that's fixed. So again, before you take that listing, Minnie's got to get on the phone with her divorce attorney, right? And figure out where is that deed? How do we get the deed? Sometimes what the agreement really says is many can live there till the kids graduate high school, then we'll sell it and split it. Well, certainly we're going to need Mickey and Minnie to both sign everything for the sale to go through, because even though he doesn't live there, he's still an owner. All right, so marriage is important, whether you're on the buy side or sell side, ask if you're married. If they say they're divorced and the person's name is still on the deed, we got to address that even before we get it out there. All right? All right. Next. All right. Again, dealing with the seller. I can't tell you how many contracts I get with no seller's name on it. Just the parents has no name on it. <laughs> I'm going to put it in because no I don't know my name. Not to get that name. <laughs> even if the listing agent is non responsive, it's on the tax records. You can all get access to the tax records. So there's really no excuse not to have seller on there. And of course, it makes it more difficult for us or just another step for us to even figure out who's my client when I actually represent the seller. I'm like, who are they? I'm tracking down the realtor and asking who do I represent. Okay. Next is property address. So one of the things that people really don't put in the property address and I kind of like you to get into the habit of doing is adding in there if there's a parking spot, right? So like after it says 102 and a half, 
you know, West 52nd Street, I just put in like comma, you know, one parking spot. Like assuming this is a condo, right? Parking spots are really important. Parking spots worth $30,000, right? And now what happens is, of course you get some lawyers who don't know to ask if parking's included. And if they don't ask and we get to closing, you know, some someone brings up a parking spot first time around, obviously your buyer's having a fit if they find out there is no parking, okay? But the way it usually comes up for me is that a home under appraises, right? I get the appraisal and under appraised by 30,000 bucks. And now of course we're all in a panic. How are we gonna save this deal? Can we fix the appraisal? Will people pay more, right? And of course, as I go through the appraisal with you, what do I see? There's no parking spot, right? The appraiser only gets the form contract. The appraiser does not get my attorney review letter that added in the parking spot. So they don't know about it. And they didn't put it in their appraisal. And now you're home under appraised. And now we got to go back and file an appeal and hope that they increase the value, right? So if we put it in there right on the address, or even if you put it in paragraph 43 that says this includes one parking spot, right? You put it both places. No one can miss it, right? Same thing. Some of our buildings here, like the you know, Beacon, whatever, they have storage lockers, right? We should know about it. If it's not on the contract, the lawyer may not know. And there might be problems years down the road, let alone before closing. All right, so this is a little thing they probably don't teach you about, you know, property addresses, but I get in the habit of doing that. Any thoughts on that, Karen? Nope. Um, even if it's just street parking, do you want to? Well, street parking, parking means no parking is included, right? Especially <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So. No, no, I, I'm, I'm worried about putting stuff in there we care about, right? So, um, so now we down. All right, so now we're down to purchase price. So how can anybody get the purchase price wrong? They really don't get the purchase price wrong, but for me, when I'm doing the attorney review and I see the purchase price, my next question for the clients is whether they understand that they're going to have Closing costs, right? Now, closing costs are everything from bank fees, title insurance, surveys, condo maintenance fees, initiation fees, real estate taxes, legal fees, you name it, right? And we generally think in terms like if I'm looking at a home this value, you know, 400000 I'm going to estimate that they're going to need around 3% of their purchase price. Um, which in this case, I'm just going to say they'll need about $12,000 in closing costs on top of their down payment. Now, we haven't done any of the down payment information yet. So, so why don't we, uh, but we'll get to it right now. Okay. So, so a lot of times I ask my clients, hey, do you have that extra 12000 And their answer is no. Right? I got eight. Right, I got six. I put it all down. So now we got to figure out how do we deal with covering that money, right? Can we change our deposit? Can we add in a seller's concession? Uh, and we'll go through those things right now. Okay. So uh, also know this: when we've got a million dollar or more property, and God bless, that should be your problem, right? There's also something called a mansion tax, which is basically 1% of the purchase price. So if we had a million dollar property, instead of me using 3%, I use, a, I use 2%, right? So that would be normal closing costs are about 20 grand. But now that I've got this mansion tax back on top of it, so I'm kind of back to my 3%, they need 30,000 bucks. And again, Call me, call your mortgage rep, right? No one expects you to know all of this. Over time, we'll learn it more and more. But I'm a resource for you to use so we don't make these mistakes. All right. 
their initial deposit. Almost every contract you see has a big fat zero for the initial deposit, and it's just blank. Now, what I've been doing in these multiple offer and bidding war situations is I'll say 5,000. We're going to do this if it's a bid, right? Yeah, we're going to say $5,000. Now, again, all the other offers say zero. Now, what's our client going to do? Go to the beginning of the next page, of the next page. All right, so right there on line 52, you're going to check the box that says buyer's attorney. Okay, and then you're going to type in where it says other. Wait, and just type in Brodsky and Brodsky. Okay. Okay, and then honor before is just going to be today's date because we're attaching it today. Now, assuming your client is over 25 years old age and they know what a checkbook is, right? <laughs> You're going to ask them to write out a personal check to Brodsky and Brodsky and take a picture of it and just text you that picture for inclusion. They're not giving me the check, right? If we win the bidding war and we get out of review, they'll drop it off to me. But otherwise, it's just a piece of paper. But when everyone else is showing zero, 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 and yours has five grand, 10 grand, I had one we attached 80 grand. There was a Ooh, you attach 80 grand. We attached a picture of a check, right? We were going to be given that 80 grand within 10 days anyway. All right, so let's go back up the line to the next page, previous page. All right, so the next thing is usually additional deposit. Now, it's sort of traditional that you're putting, let's just say, um, let's see, what's our financing going to be on this? 90%? Uh, yeah, let's put some percent down. All right, so we're going to do 10% down. So now the question is, so that shows like we're going to put 5% up front and 5% on the day of closing. So on the additional deposit, what's 5% of 375? All right, divided by two. 18,750. Right, but we already gave 5,000 on the check. So line 46 becomes 13,750. Okay. Now we might as well, I don't know, uh, do you want to put in the mortgage amount or keep putting? No, that's not the mortgage amount. No, I'm just gonna that, take sh the that should be 18. Okay, yeah. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Minus <laughs> Why do you say that? Times five gives you five percent, and times uh, ninety-five gives you ninety-five. Anyway, all right. So these are our numbers, and believe it or not, they don't always automatically update. So a lot of times, the people who put in the five thousand dollar deposit, then the additional deposit still reads eighteen seven fifty, and the last is eighteen seven fifty. So we're giving too much. Okay. So now let's assume that I get this contract and I go over this with my client and I ask them about their $12,000 in closing costs and they say they don't have it. So what does that mean for us, right? It means we can't afford to buy this house with the current offer. They won't have the money to pay for their closing costs. So in that case, you know, when we're in a bidding war situation, we're really not able to put in what's called a seller's concession. Do the people know what a seller's concession is? No. No one knows what a seller's concession is. Well, some of them may. Do everybody right. know what a seller's concession is? What? A seller's concession. No. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me give you a real quick explanation of a seller's concession. So the way the seller's concession would work on this offer is that we would increase our offer and we're not going to do it but increase our offer by twelve thousand dollars right so it would become three hundred and eighty seven thousand we increase our mortgage amount right by the because it's a higher amount in the financing 
And then we put into paragraph 43 that the seller agrees to give us back the 12,000 and pays our costs for us. Now, it's not really that the seller is giving us anything, right? We've overinflated the price, which lets us build it into our loan. And it's really the loan that's paying it, right? And the seller is really just helping us with the legal money laundering scheme that the banks are okay with, right? But that's really what they're doing. Um, anyone have questions on sort of the general explanation of what is the seller's concession? Well, we're good online. Not that they're all muted, so they couldn't answer anyway. <laughs> all right. So the problem with doing that, of course, is now we've overinflated the price, which means there's a high risk that it's not going to appraise, right? Especially if we if we are offering asking price or above asking, and now we're going to jack it up another twelve grand. Who says it's going to appraise? The other thing that we're doing is we're basically telling the seller, we're too broke to buy your house, <laughs> right? And we kind of don't want to do that. So instead, what I would look at is doing is before we even put in the offer, you know what? This is going to have to be a 5% down, 95% financing deal. And really to a seller, it's not like there's a big difference between someone's putting down 5% versus 10%. And the highest and best it is. But if your client can't afford it, we have no choice. We have no choice. Right? right. So now I'm going to change this. If we can, we, I would just change it right to 5% down. So leave the first two numbers the same. Mm -hmm. Think about that. I just change the mortgage amount to the correct amount. There's three seven five. <laughs> <Keeping> six. <laughs> That's why your numbers never add up. Get the heck out of here. That's a lie. <laughs> three fifty six. Two fifty. All right, but then our number of closing is so do this. So now we add any sales concession in here. Okay. No, let's let me try this. We, no, we're not going to do the sales concession because okay. we just said we can't. Okay. Let me clear this whole thing. 375 times 95. 35625. Five. Minus. I got one, one zero too many in there. That's what that was. Okay. No, 356. 356. No, I have mine right. You have one. No. All those numbers have to equal 375. Yeah, I understand that. Right, so that's, so that's right. Okay, so then your cash to close, your balance to close becomes zero. So what we did is we left our client with an extra $18,000 in his pocket. Our client now has the 12 grand to cover their closing costs. And they actually have an extra 6,700 to use for other things of value, right? Because when we're talking about a multiple offer situation, Sellers are looking for us to waive part of our inspections, to waive part of our appraisal, right? To waive condo doc review, to waive whatever we're willing to waive. So if our client now has six, seven grand extra in his pocket, he can now afford to waive some things, right? Before he was so broke, he couldn't have waived anything anyhow. So now what type of home are we looking at here? Is this a condo? Or no, what? this is a single family house. Single family house. Okay, so obviously we can afford to put in the offer room, hey, like fire weighs $5,000 of inspection issues. And if the worst case scenario happened, we know our client has the five grand to cover. Now, just because you waive $5,000 of inspection issues, doesn't mean it costs you $5,000 when you close. So for example, when I bought my house, there were sliding doors to the backyard and one of them was really fogged over moisture and milky white, right? So I was like, how can you expect me to sit in my kitchen looking through this disgusting door? I got a $900 credit so I could replace that panel, right? So I can honestly tell you right now in my garage, 
are new doors waiting to be installed. I actually got French doors, right? I didn't replace the glass panel. And I bought my house 11 years ago. I didn't even notice the stooping milky window for the past 11 years. The only reason that I redid the doors is because I put in a new deck. So now I wanted fancier doors. So when a client waves something that's broken, unless it's like an active leak, who needs to fix it, right? It's not immediate cash out of pocket. But if it is cash out of pocket, our client has the extra 6750 to use and therefore can afford to waive it. So if it was up to me, if we're in a bidding war and we had a choice between showing 10% down but not being able to waive any part of our inspections, or showing 5% down and being able to waive inspections, some part, not all. Right? I would go for the waiver of the 5,000. Now, one of the things that I've been seeing a lot of recently. Can I say something? Yeah, please. We're not telling them to waive it. We're giving them suggestions on how people win the bid. It's totally up to that buyer what they want to choose to do. They can choose not to win. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, since we jumped to inspections, let's jump to, well, not, we'll just leave, uh, I guess 43. We're going to jump to parallel 43. All right, so what I see in a lot of contracts nowadays that, that drives me crazy when we end up having to fix and review is there'll be a paragraph in here that says one of two things to say another thing, right? I see a lot where it says inspections are for informational purposes only. So my question to my client in review is, so you waived inspections? And they're like, no, I get to do inspections. I'm like, but if it's for your information only, that means you don't get to object. Like the house could be on fire and you don't get to object to it because it's just for your information. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I have to be able to cancel if there's a serious problem. Like, well, okay. Like, what are you willing to wait? Right? Like, are we just limiting this to structural issues, environmental issues, to termite issues? Are you waiving the right to inspect the plumbing? No, I want to inspect the plumbing. The electric? No, I'm not waiving. So they're not waiving anything. Right? And it's like, well, why did you sign this? It's like, well, my realtor prepared it and said, I need to do certain things to win. And I just trusted them, but they never explained it to me what it meant. So that's one thing I see that you should never do. Informational purposes only means don't waste your time on inspections. You see how the buyer just blamed the realtor said? <laughs> so that's why we have in all our rest for disclosures, we do not encourage or tell them <laughs> the wave anything but this is what he just said they're going to come back in a court of law and say karen said and i can tell you this like when i'm doing the attorney review like the one we just wrote up i'm showing five grand immediately right the other thirteen thousand is due in 10 days and i asked my client right do you have that eighteen thousand seven fifty available within the next 10 days and so many times they're like, no, right? Like they might have the money, but it's in stock, it's in bonds, it's in a pension, they got to get it out. They won't have it in time. I'm like, but you said you had it. Like your initials are an inch and a half away from the number. How could you initial that? And they all say the same things. They basically say, it's the iTunes agreement. I don't read it. I just click yes, yes, yes. Right? They're in their phone. They're at a bar. They're at a traffic light. Yeah, dock your sign, whatever. Right? So they don't read these things. And it really is on us to prepare it right and to walk through it with them. And that's what attorney review is doing, is the walkthrough that you guys don't do anymore since we don't sit down with our clients anymore face-to-face -to, -face to sign contracts. Right, with DocuSign, you just gotta assume they're not reading it. Every error just goes through until attorney review, which is when we're fixing it. All right, so the better we get it from the start, the less changes and the quicker we're out of review.
All right. So the other thing that I'm, I've been seeing now on these inspection limitations is what they say is like health and safety only. Right. And they're putting that in. Buyer can only object to structural health and safety. But what is, first of all, structural, just so you know, does not include systems, appliances, right? Plumbing, electric, none of that's structural. So it's saying structural only. That's fine if our clients really understand that. You know, but that's almost like a rehab property, you know. Or you know, reality is when we're talking about a condominium, you know, the association owns the structure, right? And we're only real dealing with like the contents of the unit, yeah. right? Maybe the hot water heater, your appliances, your toilet bowl, your shower head, you know, windows. So in that, usually when we put in waiving like thirty-five hundred dollars, five thousand of inspections. We really waived almost everything that could be wrong with the condo. And if it's bigger than that, we're still protected. And that means there's some major condo building problem. Okay. So I like to put waivers in terms of dollar amounts because our clients can understand a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing is the following is I've been putting in um, buyers may only object to the following inspection issues, right? And I make a list. So A, we put like a little A parenthesis, right? We put environmental issues, right? We're always gonna be checking for asbestos, for lead paint, for burying oil tanks. Right. Environmental. Environ. R-O-N. Environ. R-O-N. Like me. Mental. Right? <laughs> Environmental issues. Right? And that would even cover mold for our crazy mold genetics. So, uh, so B would be um, wood destroying insects. Right? We cannot get a mortgage commitment without a clear term on the We can't close without it. Right? So even though it's typically like a five, six hundred dollar treatment, it's kind of necessity in order to buy the house. Right? And C, and this one will, will fluctuate from client to client, and say a single item costing a thousand dollars or more. Let me explain what this means and how we might modify it. Okay. So what's a thousand dollars, right? A thousand dollars is really you need a new hot water heater, right? Air conditioning, major structural issue, right? But if a burner on the stove isn't working, we wouldn't cancel it over that either, right? If a sliding door panel to your back deck was fogged over, would you really kill it over that? No. No, right? That's 900 bucks, right? So window latches, right? A drip under a sink, who's killing it? An outlet that doesn't work, no one's killing it, right? So obviously when I'm out in more expensive houses, my preset is like a thousand bucks, but your client might be, all right, how about $500? Right, so we'll change this to five hundred dollars because it's a you know three hundred seventy-five thousand dollar house. You know, people only have five percent to put down. They're going to be scared of a thousand dollar problem, yeah. right? But the reality is, you know, when we talk about waiving like five thousand dollars of inspection issues, we never get there unless we have a big ticket item to bring us there. It's not like you add up so many outlets and switches and sinks that we ever get there. So this way it's almost like an unlimited waiver to the seller, but we protected our client because if it's environmental, wood destroying insect or 500, 750, 1000, whatever our number is, they're protected from catastrophe, right? I've had clients where we put our number at 3,500 because we're like, ah, even if we got a new hot water here, 
we, we wouldn't kill the deal over it. We got to make sure that air conditions run. And that's our 35. All right. Any questions on inspection waiver? Did I lose a lot of people? <laughs> Yolanda left me. She never leaves me. <laughs> Antonio, you got a question? I see your mute Lincoln. No. So, so what happens is this, right? The seller, right? The seller, they invite what's called highest and best, right? And the reason they say best because highest isn't always the best, right? So for example, let's say somebody bids $30,000 over asking, but they don't waive any of their appraisal. They say it's not the price. And somebody else waives $15,000 over asking, but they waive $15,000. So do you go after the dream of the extra 30, which might net you zero, or do you go for the 15, because it's more guaranteed, right? So we just talked about how appraisals can revalue a deal. Well, inspections, they come up within a week or so. Those can re-evaluate the whole deal too. So they don't want to pick up a winner who's then going to try to beat them up on inspection and get their money back or threaten to kill it over a hot water heater stolen in a fine window. Right, so the purpose of this isn't that it speeds it up, is to show the seller that you're going to close. You're not going to find a way out. You're not going to renegotiate your price. And, and that's the risk you're willing to take is a $500 item, $1,000, whatever it is. Basically saying, I'm not going to complain about any of this stuff. Okay? And I'm not clear on the rest, right? All right. <laughs> All right. So let me slide over. We lost Karen. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, we talked about the deposit. Now, you were a type of mortgage. All right. So this mortgage amount, and I guess on her form, it just does an auto update. But just make sure this mortgage amount should match the same on the front page. It was three hundred fifty-six two fifty. I'll try to. Put that in there, three, seven, six, two, fifty. Okay. Now, um, do we know the difference between FHA and conventional? Karen, what do your people know about FHA? Nothing. Nothing. I know a little bit of this. FHA will be a government. Right, so, so what happens is this, the primary reason that people go FHA is being able to get approved for the loan. So FHA, which is a government product, permits for a lower credit score. It permits for a higher debt to income ratio. I don't know if you had a mortgage guy talk about that, but Real quick, the mortgage company is going to look at all of your income and all of your bills. And then they have a ratio, like let's just say 60%. Right? So if you were someone who made $60,000 a year, right? And your debts exceeded 60%, which is 36,000, right? Then you can't get the loan because there's a big risk that you might miss payments, default on something, not be able to afford a repair, or if you're injured or laid off work short term, you may lose the house. Where FHA, and I'm just making this up, they might say, you know what? We'll let you have 70% debt. So you can have 42,000 committed to debt and we'll still lend you the money. So some people, the only way they can get a loan is to go FHA. The other thing that FHA lets you do is they do three and a half percent down 
instead of, in, like in our case, we're putting down 5%. But if our client really needed the money, we could have gone 3.5% FHA. Now, sellers are really kind of prejudiced against FHA. Yeah. I do lots and lots of closings with FHA. They close at the same rate that conventional loans close. But there's just a real bias against it. You're assuming your buyer has less money, less credit, higher risk of not being approved. An FHA mortgage, their appraiser does sort of a mini inspection. And they'll come along and say things like, you got to scrape and paint all the window sills and repaint the garage. And there's a shingle missing on the roof that we don't Light have. bulb one time. Right, light bulb, <laughs> repaint this, not enough lights in the stairways. And say, we're not going to land unless you do this. Right, of course, the seller doesn't want to do it. And our buyer didn't actually even care about it. He knew everything was wrong with that during inspections. He said, I don't care. And now we're at a problem where a loan could blow up the deal, right? So it's rare. We usually find solutions, but there is a prejudice against it. So if we can keep it conventional, it's the best thing we can do. Well, there's some 33% conventional too. Right. I think Wells Fargo has like a 3% product, although I deeply hate Wells Fargo. Well, on the same <laughs> level as Bank of America, Chase, and the other. So what your real real is. I mean, you know, no, but all of our local mortgage trusts that we deal with, I like. What? No, no. See, listen, the big banks are highly regulated, and they have their rules, and they do what they do. And there is no talking to somebody for a favor or flexibility. In fact, there's rarely talking to somebody. Every time you call, you get a different number on, a, on an 800 line. So what they Well, no, you got, no. We, we have, have in-house mortgage loan. Mortgage right. Who are you working there? with now? Loan Depot and United yeah. Mortgage. So I've been working with Loan Depot. Yeah. United Mortgage. Yeah, so there's local. United Mortgage. United Mortgage. United. Oh. Right, but the local mortgage reps, and there's other companies that we've all run into. And they've got an office here, and you can call them day, nights, weekends, and you can call them saying, hey, the first pre-approval you gave me was 10% down, but after morning talk to the client, he can only put down five because he needs the money for the closing cost. Can you shoot me over an updated pre-approval at 95? It's in your email before you're done, and you can submit it, right? Go to rocketmortgage.com you know, and try to get it done. So that's the issue, right? Having somebody we call, we know, who, who the condos, understands what a condo is. Who even understands the Jersey City market. Right. Yeah. Or might be able to tell you, oh, this building has a problem. We know it and we can work around it. We're just like a big bank because like, eh, it's not wrong to worry about. You know, so it makes a difference who the lender is, and chasing that best rate isn't always the best thing because also like the big banks. You know, one thing we'll get to, I might as well talk about it now because it's next, is the close date, right? So the close date on this contract, God, we have a lot of time. October. So no, well, the, so <laughs> what we. Estimated because we didn't find a property. Now we found oh, the okay. property. Okay, we found the property. So, so the commitment we got a month out. Right. Generally, you can get your days. commitment a month out. The closing date, um, generally with conventional was uh, 60. 45, 60 days. Yeah. So you would just put it in for the end of August, right? Like yeah. she said, I end know it's August, August 27th, okay. and that is the weekend. Okay, now I'm doing a turn interview. I said the close date's August 27th, right? I explained to them that that's an estimated close date, which means either you or the seller can delay for approximately two weeks without penalty. So August 27th can all of a sudden become September 10th, 11th. Is that okay? Or are you going to be homeless come August 31st, right? Uh, and I got to make sure of that. 
So sometimes we're going to change that thing into what's called a time of the essence state. I'll explain that in a minute. Now, the other thing I'll tell them at that time is do not lock in an interest rate for August 27th, right? Because they're going to look for cheap interest rates. And you'll see really two different rates nowadays. One is sort of your standard 60-day interest rate. And then there is a 45-day interest rate, right? Um, that might be an even percent lower. They always want to try for the lowest. The problem is what happens if we get to August 27th and the seller's not ready to close? They're going to lose that interest rate. Or to keep it, they're going to be paying extension fees. 800 bucks, right? Buy them three days, another 800, right? That's now, money. our local mortgage reps, usually they'll protect them from doing that type of thing, you know, 60 days when it's 45. The other thing is that, and I can't speak for all of them, but a lot of times it's like, listen, we can't close Friday, that's the last day. We can close Monday. They can usually give us like a free three day extension. We're like the big bank, they're like, nope, you can do it 850. <laughs> right? And what are you going to do at that time? Switch? No, nope, so, you're going to pay you. So there's a lot of reasons that we tell you to use the in house approved mortgage reps. It's not because we're getting money from it. I mean, the money we get is because the deal closes. We get the commission, you get your commission. So it's important to control who they use when you can. All right, but you all understand that the close date is estimated. Do not plan your movers. Do not tell your landlord you're getting out. Do not lock in your interest rate for that date. Okay, at least minimum of two weeks after that. So the items included in sale, you want to make sure that we're not just saying ask for MLS. You want to actually look at the MLS and type in everything that is on the MLS. So in this case, only thing that is included is the oven slash range, which is gas. So you want to type that in. Now, what I would like you to get in the habit of doing, and this really doesn't happen, I guess, because of the way your DocuSign program works, or people don't think about it. When you set up DocuSign, that's what you use, whatever you use, yeah. right? You select what documents to attach to that email. Room, to that up, room, yeah. right? Get in the habit of attaching the MLS. Nobody does it. I do. Okay, Karen does because she's perfect <laughs> after 20 years. And probably because I yelled at her <laughs> the past 18 years to include it, so she learned. But if it's not in there, I don't get it because eventually the whole thing gets sent to me and it's not in that original package, right? So if you include it, then we don't have to worry if somebody puts in as per the MLS because I'll have the MLS. Or even if you type in your list, since I have the MLS, I'll be able to look at it. And the MLS also has things like real estate taxes on it that I need to review with my client. I do that in attorney review. What are your taxes? Monthly maintenance fees for the condo. Often talks about parking spaces or storage spaces. So give us the MLS, please. And if you just click that box when you're setting up the, uh, the DocuSign room, it'll be in there automatically. Something else that often gets uh, missed from the DocuSign is you'll go through and let's skip to the addendum for a second. Yeah. You don't mind? Mm -hmm. no. Go down some more. Almost. Come on. Where are the magical boxes? Right there. Ah, right here. Here we go. Right? So have you taught them about these boxes or not yet? Yeah, they know, but they you know, know. some of them okay. don't know. Fine. So, so many of you click the condo box, right? Boom. Click it. Now, when you click that, it automatically comes up as part of the contract as you're filling it out. Um. No. no, you got to pull the document right. in. So now you got to pull the document in. And then after you do that, you have to attach it to your DocuSign. 
Now, one of the things that holds up our closing and makes us miss a date is of course, once they clear our loan for closing, it doesn't really mean that we're cleared to close. It means that we're cleared to the final review department of underwriting. And then somebody at that time finally realizes that although you clicked the box for the condo addendum, never you gave never it. gave us one. And now they're holding up the whole deal till they get one. You're now gonna have to generate it, send it around for everybody to sign, which you know could cause a delay, mm -hmm. and then get it back to the bank for them to go back and review it and make sure there's no problems. Yeah. All of a sudden we miss our close date instead of Friday, it's Monday. Yeah. Who's losing their shit on this? Everybody. So for the um uh, no, 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 no. Well, one, it's in the list. Usually, when you're preparing it, right? Like, can we pull up the condo document? Yeah, let me go add it to the um, They're running away from you, man. They're just fleeing. Yeah, it's supposed to go to 12 to 2, so we're a little bit over time. Yeah. So, is it nine or is it three? That shows like nine in the chat. Four. Okay. That's not a comment. Four on the oh, board. yeah. Oh, okay. Four on the board. okay. That's All right. So the condo document, you're going to have to go to the N. N mm -hmm. Condo document, you're going to have to go to the NJAR and get the uh, condo really? addendum. That's right. Those are all the addendums. Uh, are they the same condos? It's the same, yes, yes. same we'll addendum the form. Yeah. Yeah, you'll see the form. Versus like the individual association is going to be a part of, you don't have to include that particular one. Any association you're part of is basically a condo. Whether it looks like a high rise building or a community with a swimming pool or whatever. It's the New Jersey NJAR Addendum Condominium Homeowners Association document. So this is a generic PDF or something. Yeah, you'll see it in a second. I'll show you what it says. So now go to that. And again, you got to fill it out. All right, so look. So the top block, big, right? So the big box right there. This is asking you for the name and number of the homeowners association. Oh, okay. Sometimes that's in the listing, I think down in the lower left corner. Most of the sure. times not on a goddess right. database. Other times you might not have it, you just say to be advised, right? TBM. Right, then line 18, it's saying one of the maintenance fees. Now that's almost always on the MLS. Correct. So you'll type that in there, right? Right, for the assessments, right, the next section, I would normally just put in zero. Like, unless the MLS says eight is an assessment, but this time put in zero because our clients don't want to pay for any kind of assessment. But that's the whole form. And all that says is that this purchase is subject to a review of the condo box make sure there's no problem and most lawyers we put it in our letters anyway but the lender is going to say you check the box for it where the heck is it i'm not approving this till you give me the actual form same so, with all the rest of them same with everything they're going to say you check the box where is it you check the box where is it? if you don't check the box they're not asking for it. okay that doesn't mean don't check it <laughs> i'll just be stupid and not check anything <laughs> All right, so we, I think we can go back to the main. Question. Yeah, which is items excluded from the sale. Um, again, it's going to be on the MLS if it's a chandelier, if it's, if it's something that is precious to that owner, they're going to exclude it. If it's the um, refrigerator, double doors, if it's the washer and dryer, excluded from the sale, it should be on the MLS. Make sure that you type it out, not just say for MLS. Right. Let me ask you a question. This property, is this a real listing or is this fictitious? No, this is yeah. a real listing. All right, do me a favor. Pull up the Zillow for this listing. Just search the property address. And I do the address for sale and then I just click on the Zillow. That's 215. 
Mm -hmm. And what time? Closing after I explain this, okay. we're pretty much through everything that happens to get to this. Okay. So when I do a turn review, believe it or not, where are the pictures? It's only one picture. There's only one picture. This sucks. Yeah, I can't get in yet. Finish. Oh, okay. <laughs> pull up. Can you pull up any other one? Just anything that's active. Okay. So when I do attorney review, now because of COVID, there's so many pictures on all these things. I can basically do a walkthrough with the client. Right? So I'll just like on this one. Can we get to the other pictures? So I'll just flip through it, right? And I'll look at this and I'll be like, I sometimes like that island looks like it's on wheels, right? The kitchen island. So I'll add to my list, right? Kitchen island included, right? All ceiling fans and light fixtures. So step through it, right? Now that's a chalkboard on the wall, but it might be a flat screen TV, right? Is the flat screen TV included? Almost never, but there's a mounting bracket that is bolted to the wall. And if they remove that mounting bracket, they're gonna leave four big holes. So I'll ask my client, do we want them to leave, like go back one, right? Do we want them to leave the bracket right there? We can see the back of a TV mounted on the wall because you're gonna put a TV in the same spot or do we want them to remove that bracket and patch the wall, but they're not gonna paint it for you. You're gonna paint it yourself, right? So I just go through, right? Wash your dryer and make sure that's included, right? Just flip through them. You got a second kitchen, second kitchen. Now I got a problem. Is this a two family house we're looking at? Yeah. Good. This one's a two family. There's a lot of times we see quote unquote bonus apartments. Yeah. Just so you know, well, the real definition of bonus apartment. apartment is illegal apartment. There is no such thing as bonus apartment. And whenever you see a stove that should set off alarm bells for you, is this an illegal apartment? So there's the finished basement. Right, so we got a finished basement. So now I might add into my that review is letter. Apartment. Is there a permit, right? Seller represents there was a permit for the pool that I'm looking at now, right? The deck and the finished basement, yeah. right? So I actually do a full walkthrough. Now this one has a, a what's it, an awning over the deck. I just saw a picture of it. People will rip that off the wall and take it with them. Cost them a few grand. I will add into my review letter, right, that the awning is included. So I'm doing a full walkthrough in review. So obviously, if you see items like that when you're showing the house and it's not in the listing, make a little note. So when you draw up the contract, you just put it in there. I mean, I don't mind. I'm going to do it anyway. But if your whole thing is, Marty, why aren't we out of attorney review yet? Just it's because I'm putting in the awning, right? I'm fixing the deposit and the loan amount and the close date, and I'm adding Mickey Mouse to it, and right, and I'm doing all that stuff, and that's what my attorney review is. Um, so obviously, when you're going in, just real quick, because I got to run on a bidding war. What I do is I do this whole attorney review before you ever submit your offer. And I'll go over it with you and your client and I will squeeze every penny out of them. You don't have to. I will discuss about waiving inspection, waiving part of appraisal, waiving condo doc review, letting them stay longer, all the issues so that we now prepare this contract as perfect as we can. And then I actually draw up a really short attorney review letter that just says basically I re reviewed it and approved it and there's no other changes coming, it's perfect. And now when you submit your offer, remember we've got the full contract, perfect. We got my letter as short as could be, one page instead of eight. We got a copy of a $5,000, $10,000 check attached to it, right? And now you're presenting it like, look, pick us because it's already reviewed, we got money, way, 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 we're the best even if somebody is 15,000 higher than us, maybe all the other things that we do in this package make us strongest, okay? So again, if anybody's left, 
My cell phone number, 732-616-0527. Please, if we haven't worked, shoot me a text. I don't think anybody has today, shame on you all. Um, and once you do that, I am totally part of your team, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you. And whenever Appreciate you want it. me again, I'm going to have to come back. Eat some lunch on your way out. <laughs> I'm going to finish up this contract so that we have a complete video, y'all. So um, we left off on line number 143, 144, um, which talks about the repair for the CCO or the CEO. Jersey City, we just have the small certificate generally on a single family, you got to make sure that um, the rooms have the proper fire um, detector, radon, and the kitchen have the um, fire extinguisher. So all together, that might be one and a half percent of 375 or $500 approximately, might be a little bit less, but that would be about an average of one and a half percent. Municipality assessments, again, if it's an assessment, you would have been notified in the MLS from the listing agent. So most of the time it has not been notified. 19 years, never click, yes. If it's a one family, two family, you wanna make sure that you put the dwelling there. It's a one family unit, so you wanna spell it out. Possession, occupancy and tenancy. Again, if it's one family and it's occupied with tenants, are the tenants staying, are they leaving? Um, you wanna make sure of that. In this case, we want it vacant, so we're gonna put not applicable. If they're staying, we wanna put the tenant's name, put applicable, put the location. And here we're gonna put deliver vacant. That page, yes, this has is applicable because it was built before 1978. We went to the MLS to pull the lead, so we know it has the lead statement attached to it. Again, we are filling in boxes. The attorney is gonna totally disregard this contract and put it in terms to protect that buyer. 240, line 240, we're gonna put um, two days. I generally put two days, we wanna reply back. Sometimes if you put um, 24 hours, you kind of piss off the seller, like, why are you rushing me? They got up to three days. Okay. Point of entry, we're gonna put not applicable. Cesspools, we do not deal with cesspools here in the city. So that's gonna be not applicable. Um, if there is one, we want the seller to bear the cost, not the buyer. But in this case, no cesspool is located on a premises. Our next link will be the home inspection. He went over those issues and how we get credit. Our buyers are entitled. Our buyers are entitled to their inspection. So we're going to put a 10-day inspection. The computer gave it four days. If you're in a bidding war, you might even want to drop it down to a seven-day home inspection provision. But the seller know you're not going to waste time and you're going to get your inspections in. Um, so if they have to put their house back on the market, you're doing it relatively quick. Let's go to our next slide. The contract is about finished. Line number 55545, five, five, five. your firm name is gonna go here, which is KW City Life JC Realty. And I'm just, you can spell that all out. I'm just abbreviating. Your name is the representative of this account. So in this case, that would be Karen Sins, whoever's on their computer doing it themselves. It would be your name. And it would be your name. Tracy, it would be your name. In this case, remember, if it's a Keller Williams, so Keller Williams, that is a Keller Williams 190 Christopher Columbus and Bayonne falls under 190 Christopher Columbus. It's all KW. We are automatically a disclosed dual agent. If it's another color whim, Toboken, uh, two buck two, it's not a disclosed dual agent. If it's white grid, Carwell Banker, you're just a buyer agent. Information is supplied by KW City Life JC.
And again, because we exclude dual agent, we don't have to put who we represent. And then you will put all the listing information in. The listing, again, if you fill in all the details, will automatically come over. Uh, the participate in firm, which is you represent the buyer, so you're the participate in firm. You put in all your information as the buy agent. That's all going to come over. One important thing is to make sure you get in your commission right. So you want to make sure your commission is as per the MLS, which is 3.5, 2.5 minus 300. You don't worry about the listing agent information and what they're getting paid. 300 is the MLS fee that the MLS charges. Well, the agent charges through the MLS. Nine, number 599 disclosed that the buyer or seller is a real estate agent. Not. Uh, she was, but she's no longer, so I can put it up. Again, all the addendums that you um, click, coronavirus, the lead, you want to make sure you do those addendums. We brought our lead in. We brought our coronavirus in, so we know we have those documents in our room. We don't have to put any additional contract provisions because we were doing that as Marty was going through this, so those are already in. This is ready to be saved and closed. Now I'm gonna go over and rapid speed the other documents. You don't have to fill it out. The most important thing today was the contract and getting the contract right. The other documents are just the documents we, that we need to support it. So I'm gonna go through this with rapid speed. The home, water, home warranty. Again, this is our party. We have it on uh, the table. If it was with us, if not, it's here. Um, you also have it online. We have two home warranty companies that we deal with. Again, if we have an issues with trying to win a bid, you can use your home warranty to say, listen, we know we, you're waiving $500. How about you take the other 500, put it on, on a home warranty. If anything breaks, at least you're covered. And we feel more comfortable about putting in our bid with waiving $500 or $1,000 because we got a home warranty that's going to back us up. So you can invite them to invest in Absolutely. You can invite your buyers to invest in it. You can invite the sellers to invest in it. If they don't do it this day, they still have the option um, to get it um, so many days after closing. Attorney General Memorandum. Um, just basically states that we're not discriminating, that they, you know, the agent has the right to present their offer, the seller has the right to look at their offer, they can't reject at least presenting the offer. Whether they win it, that's a different story. Consumer information statement on this document, we want to make sure that there's two things on here, how we represent in them and our name. So on this line where it says business relationship, I, it's me, because I'm the one that's working the file. So it's Karen Sims. And if it's you, Tracy, it'd be Tracy. If it's you, Brenda, it would be Brenda. If you, Antonio, it'd be Antonia. And then how are you working? If you know it's a KW property, when you're writing it up, you're going to be a, disclose, a buyer agent and disclose dual agent. If you're writing up the contract and you know it's Caldwell Banker or Brand X, you're going to be buyer agent only. In this case, we had disclosed to an agent because it's KW to KW. Correct. Correct. All right. Remember, there's two home warranty companies. So um, we have them, they have options. We're not steering them to just one, they have options. Um, so we're going to show them both of them. Affiliated services. We have a lot of services that we offer as a company. So this is the document that we would use to show them that we are in partnership with different companies um, from settlement, which is title, to mortgage companies, to um, attorneys, to safeguard home warranty, to the American home shield warranty. They're not agreeing to the services. They're acknowledging that we told them about the services. If they want them, want them they can apply to have them. Yes. 
And well, that and emails that you would get to send off to them. Oh. Uh, informed consent to do an agency. Again, you gotta give permission, just like the seller has to get permission to look for a buyer. A buyer, when you're doing a thing, you have to have the information that you're gonna be working for both the seller and the buyer. Now, however, you may not directly ever speak to the seller, especially if it's another agent, but they just have to know that we're under the same umbrella, that we all one company. So that's why they find selling a uh, disclosed dual agency. Um, at no point in time can you give one party any unfair advantage over the other party. And when you tell them that, that makes them feel okay with signing the um, dual agency agreement. Yeah. Now there's a lot of fraud in our industry for whatever reasons, we're dealing with large money. As agents, we are never give instructions on wires. We we'll never take a wire. We we'll never give any type of email. We sign, we send in them paperwork that they understand that if they receive anything in an email or a text message, because people are now doing text messages with scams. It is not coming from me, Karen Sims. I'm telling you up front by sending you this document that I do not do anything with wires. So if you get something, it's more than likely a fraud. So hopefully it never happened to us, but it has happened where money um, at the last minute get intercepted through emails. They send the money um, and they lose those funds. But if you do it within a certain time, there's numbers on here that they can call on websites that they can visit on how to try to help get that money um, back and recovered. Um, but if it comes from me, they should actually say, pick up the phone, call Karen, did you send a wire? Karen gonna say, no, absolutely not. Call their attorney and let the, their attorney know. Don't go back and forth with the email or the text message. Don't call that number back, call your attorney. Okay, Karen, so let's say we have a buyer saying, no, they're going to the property value so Keller Williams is not an escrow company. We do not take good faith deposits. So like Marty said, send it to the buyer's attorney that you're working with or find out from the listing agent who's the seller's attorney and have that check written payable to the seller's attorney. We as a company are not an escrow company. We do not take wires or deposits. Correct. Again, protect your family from lead. This is the actual brochure. We want to get the brochure along with the um, lead disclosure. They don't have to read it. Oh, excuse me. But as long as we send it, we can prove that we sent it because it'll come back in our doctor sign check. Coronavirus. This has been a den. Um, revised, the whole harmless has been revised. This one is the same, it's gonna be 30 days and you wanna check this. So we still, we're still dealing with a new strand of COVID and if, if anyone saw the news, it's um, rising in the state of New Jersey rapidly. So coronavirus is still around. This is gonna give you a buyer the opportunity if anything happened, they got 30 days to try to get that um, cleared but if they lose their job and we have number two checks and they is a result of COVID, we don't have to prove that it's COVID. This document can actually get them out of their contract. Not good for us, but if it's you know circumstances where that has happened, you know, they're protected and we're working for the buyer. Now the whole homeless is the one that we want to sign so that we can show our, our buyers any property we go until we know that they're covered. They only have to sign it one time, date it, and whatever date we start. So today we're in the 7th, the 14th of July. This document, until we find them a house, until they end our relationship, they only have to sign one time for the coronavirus, and we're good with state um, regulation. Before it used to be each and every time we go to a different house. We already went over the contract, exclusive buyer agency, very important. You want your buyer to be dedicated to you. So you want to have that buyer consultation up front, explain everything, 
and make sure that they don't have another business relationship with someone else because you don't work for anything. Also, if we don't know at the time when we're doing a buyer exclusive agency agreement, so we're going to be a disposable agent if that opportunity arrives. The commencement will be today and it will expire the 14th. And I usually go about six months, three to six months out. So we'll say on uh, January of 2021, of 2022, that this will expire. So it starts today, six months from today would be January 14th of 2022 that this will expire. Agent or brokerage fee, Generally, it's two and a half percent. I know we'll be sending a lot of two percent, and hopefully, we'll never see one percent from a Fox News again because they've been gone out of business. But our commission is generally two and a half percent. So, if we're finding something that's not on the MLS, we're asking our buyer that they will pay for our time and services for putting the deal together, and that fee is two and a half percent. Now, can you put three percent? Yes. Can you put three and a half percent? Yes. Will the buyer pay you that much? That's up to that buyer. But mostly buyers are savvy and they know we're getting anywhere from two to two and a half percent. So they're not going to pay you more. Perhaps they will. And we put this within a 90 day, 120 day um, time period. And that's all you would need to sign on there. Lead-based paint, remember we brought that in from the MLS, so it's already signed by the seller. It's already signed by my, the listing agent. Now, this is the wrong one, but it's not signed by anybody. So let me find the right one by adding it in. So this one here, I, I brought it in from the MLS. Uh, seller has no report, seller has um, no knowledge. Both sellers have signed it, the listing agent has signed it. Now your buyer will sign line A, B, C, will check, has this 10 day opportunity. I always say, give them the opportunity. Don't let your buyer waive anything. They sign it and you as the buyer's agent, you sign it. So, uh, um, how would you know if it had lead in it? Because every hospital before 1978 has lead somewhere. Right, so in this case, that agreement said that it would be wrong with that. They didn't have to be wrong with that. But my question is, if it is lead, is that something that's something that's going to be wrong with that? No, it all, it all depends on what's negotiated. I'm sorry. It all depends on what's negotiated. Oh, because if the seller is not willing to fix it, the buyer can walk away. If right. the buyer is willing to fix it, the buyer can fix it. Okay, so this is just an addendum to the contract of a statement for what the seller is saying they know. The seller is saying that they have no knowledge and they have no report. The buyer can do any inspections they want. And if in their inspections, they come up with lead. It's like any other inspection issue. You're going to negotiate if the seller going to do it, if you're going to get a credit, or if the seller not going to do anything. Oh, has nothing to do if it has if it has it and it has reports and it's already disclosed that it has it and it has reports. Then it's up to the buyer at that point if they want to move on or not. Okay, but the option the seller that they know that. Yeah, there is. It says, do the seller have Knowledge or don't the seller have knowledge? I can see that. Okay. And your wire, again, there's two different wires. Our wire for KPG is more detailed and it gives more um, details as to what to do. This one is a little more simplified. It's from the state of New Jersey. So I would like everyone to sign both. Um, this way we cover either which way, seller sign, buyer sign. Now, how do we get our documents to our seller? That's our next step. We have to create an envelope. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to select all my documents. I'm going to take off the ones that I don't want. 
which is um, the offer to purchase, the letterhead, the commission bill. I don't need to send a commission bill yet. Uh, let's see. I uh, led disclosure from that one, but it's not completed. Everything else I want to be signed. There's a box when I click off, select this box pops up. In the middle, it says create envelope. It's a pin. The pin is your indication to sign, right? You sign with a pin. So that's your indication. Click on your pin and it's going to create you an envelope to send out to your client. Now we've filled in a lot of documents, so it may take a little bit of time, so give it a little bit of patience. May take a lot of time, <laughs> but it's coming. So now they created an envelope. We see add documents to the envelope. We want to put um, envelope name. I generally use the address on everything. And when you go down to the middle of the document, and you scroll down, it's going to say add recipients to the email, to the envelope. I'm going to pre-tag the rows. When you pre-tag the rows, it's going to put the signatures there automatically. So my bio one was Minnie Mouse. And my buyer agent, that's myself, I'm the buyer agent. I'm going to pre-tag my rows too. And that's Karen. And I'm hit add selected. Now the email subject, again, the email that I'm going to send to them is 102, page one half, West 52nd Street. And I'm going to send a nice little message. Hey, Minnie. Please preview preview B I E W the document and sign or whatever little message that you want to send to the client you can put there. And then you're going to hit next up in your right hand corner yellow next. And then the computer is going to sign many signatures and Karen signatures in two different colors. So as we go down, we want to check and make sure that the computer picked up all the signatures that needs to be signed properly. Those was all the documents that I pulled in. What's that one I have to go back up. It's the home warranty. Oh, right? Yeah, this is all the warranty. You know, you got two oh. warranty companies. Now, an attorney general memorandum um, don't have the signature box. So let me show you how to put the signatures. You're going to pick up signature. You're going to drop signature. You're going to pick up date. You're going to drop date. Simple as that. You're going to find many, and you're going to do the same thing for her. You're going to pick up the signature, you're going to drop it. You're going to pick up the date, you're going to drop it. And that's how you would add a signature or a date. If you needed to add a text of some sort, you can put text, and you can put there, and then you can say whatever you need to say, um, or change, or add. And this one, we're just going to put text. In. So I can show you that. That's how it will work, and it will come out with the word testing in your box. If you needed to draw a line, you take the little line, the little pencil on the left, take the line, and now you want to cross out something because you don't want to do the whole contract, so you just want to cross it out. If you need to put in an issue, you made a change, and now you want to put an issue so they can address the change that you made, you put the initial. So that's just showing you how to do different things using DocuSign without having to go and do everything over. I'm going to delete both of that because I don't need it. 
Now let's keep going. Make sure everything is, see how it came up with many is blue. You see her signatures in blue, you see mine's in yellow. And it goes through each and every document and put what it needs to put where it needs to be. Now, it automatically, but you have to do the pre-tag row. If you don't do the pre-tag row, you'll be sitting there doing all the signatures yourself. Um, I can't go back right now, but you can review and look at the tape again. All right, you see on um, this one, it didn't put the, it didn't put there, so you want to put it there for you. Well, actually, I don't even need that one. That's an agent transfer agreement. I don't even need that. All right, um, they put it there where it needs. Um, the contract, contract came out. You see the initials at the bottom, even the initials came. I know I'm going fast but you'll see by your initials. It automatically put, I'm just making sure that all the fields where it was supposed to be put, that the actual blue is coming up. Oh, well, you should see John Carlos while you're here. Okay. All right, so there's one document that it won't come up with the pre-tag rows because remember I added this document in. So I have to go in, I have to put the initials. I have to put the, signatures. I have to put the date. And I have to switch and put mine in for my date and my signature. And now I am at the last of all the documents for my client. So the next thing I would do is hit the send button. Now I'm going to prepare the envelope. It's going to come up with a mistake because many months I put in a fictitious email in. So it's not going, oh, it was sent successfully. Stop. That means somebody got an email from Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Many months. They're gonna be like, "What the heck?" <laughs> so now, as the, um, my side, I have to sign. So I can sign right from the computer. It'll prepare my document for me to sign as the agent right from here, or I can open up my phone and on my phone I can go and sign my document. But if I'm at the computer, I might as well do it right here in the computer. Uh, it doesn't matter because the whole complete thing is not going to come through until all parties sign. They're not going to see that I signed it. I'm going to see. I'm going to see when they view it. I'm going to see when they sign it, and when it's complete, we all get a copy. So they don't see your signature until it's complete. Nope. And if it's two buyers, they won't see each other's signature. If it's two sellers, they won't see each other. They only see the complete complete document once it's all sent. So if we go back to the um, room, you see it says waiting for others. Mm -hmm. And if you click, you can see where a buyer agent has signed. Mm -hmm. Now you're waiting for the buyer. Okay. So that's pretty much our documents and how to get them signed. Once they all sign, then you have to put them in command. All these little buckets right here, um, in the front, on your front page, you have to put listing agreement, property description of form. So you would just go in. Since you did everything with DocuSign, you would click DocuSign. It will bring up the unsigned form and the signed form. And then you just match it up. So the listing agreement, we see how it says sign. You click Hudson County Community Exclusive Right to Sell, assign it, and now that's all complete. Now you want to do that for each and every last one. Yeah, now if you represent in the buyer, you're only going to have under contract and close. If you represent in the listing side, you're going to have listing under contract and close. If you're doing the same thing, it's going to seem like double work. And yes, it is double work, but you're going to have to do the under contract and close for the list side, the under contract and close for the buy side.
Both sides have to be done. The list side just has the extra step of the list to pay for. You're getting credit for two transactions with KW and two transactions with the New Jersey Board of Realtors um, for your circle of excellence. So you, it's double work, but you're getting credit and you're getting paid for both sides. So just do the work. All right, it has been a long meeting. It's almost two hours and 45 minutes. Do anybody have any questions online, Tracy? Well, it's, uh, it's, 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 in the form of money orders oh, only okay. so or a certified can... bank check, okay. whatever made payable to the landlord, we have made payable to the landlord, oh, okay. whatever is made payable to the brokerages. If it's all KW, then it comes to KW. If they oh, have okay. to split it up where the portion go to KW and the other portion go to Grand X, we get oh, that split up. So they typically bring them to us in the office. Bring them to us in the office, mail them, meet us at the property, wherever they're going to get us the money orders or the certified check. We're going to make that happen. Oh, okay. Only for sales, we don't. For sales, we don't take money. That's it. So thank you, everyone, for staying. I know it's been a long meeting. I hope you learned a lot. And um, this will be on YouTube. And have a great day. Thank you, Karen. I just uh, watched that video last night. When did you